First of all, I would like to wish a warm welcome to all the participants who just joined who are still coming in. Welcome for this uh, new EC seminar, which is uh, part of the EC Game Changers webinars. And as you know, we are now in a series that addresses uh, hazards and, and risks uh, associated with the space environment. Today, we, we will address a, a very special risk in the sense that this time the risk doesn't come from the space environment. Um, but from us. So definitely it is a major risk and may have a major impact on our lives, as you will hear shortly. Um, but this time, as I said, uh, it's something that comes from a completely different corner. So it's, I would even consider it as a blind spot in, in today's uh, research activities. And um, so I'm Thierry de Dr. I'll be your host today. And it's my, my pleasure to welcome uh, Jürgen Knoldeseder, he is, um, as a scientist, he would rather speak, I believe, about gamma ray astronomy because this is his specialty. So he, he graduated from the Technical University in, in München and um, at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physique in, in Garching. And later on, he moved to uh, to Paris and now he is at IRAP Institute in, in Toulouse. So he's uh, well known for his work on, on gamma ray astronomy because he's been working on the Comtel telescope and CDRO sat satellites, integral, just to name a few, and uh, more recently the uh, Cherenkov telescope array. And he has been chairing for several years the consortium board of the Cherenkov uh, telescope array. And you may have encountered his name, but because last year he and his team published uh, this year, actually, sorry, published two articles in, in Nature about the environmental sustainability of our research activities, which stirred lots of discussions. And this is what we hope to have today as well with all of you. So with that, um, Jürgen, uh, the floor is yours. I would just like to mention to our attendees that if you have a question, please write it down in the chat and we will go through the list of questions at the end of the presentation. So don't hesitate to write down your questions in, in the chat and we'll go through all of them later on. With that, Jürgen, it's up to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry, for the introduction and uh, thank you in particular for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and to speak to you uh, about this topic, uh, which is, I think, the most important thing is, in fact, that we speak about it. And of course, that you, you also learn about uh, uh, these issues. And uh, this is just a brand new presentation that I never gave before. Uh, moving basically from the study that I did uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, specifically on the astrophysical, uh, uh, of, on, the, on the footprint of astrophysical research infrastructures. Uh, to uh, globally the environmental sustainability of space sciences. Uh, reading a lot of, uh, uh, of course, material that is available and trying to get a full understanding of what actually is going on. And uh, to, uh, to give you some perspective, I, I want to start with what is named, uh, what is called the planetary boundaries. Maybe some of you have already heard about that. So the basic idea is that uh, that uh, in fact the, the human civilization developed during a period of uh, stability in the environmental conditions, temperature, uh, fresh water availability, biochemical uh, flows and so on. And this is called the Holocene, lasted for a bit more than 10,000 years. And, and so scientists were in fact interested to understand, I mean, how much uh, we are actually, humanity is actually already disturbing the earth system so that, that it is driven out of this stable period of the Holocene. So this is some research work that was started by um, Johan Rockström, Sweden scientist uh, in, 20, in uh, 29, 2009, sorry. And, and uh, what uh, they identified is that we have in fact the nine planetary boundaries. Uh, the first is of course climate change, but there's also a biosphere integrity, land system change, freshwater use, biochemical flows, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosol loading, stratospheric ozone depletion, you know about this very well, the ozone uh, hole, and also what, what they call now the novel entities, which is in fact chemical pollutions or, or stuff that doesn't 
exist before in, in a natural way in nature. And when they studied this, they found out that in fact, there are already four domains uh, where we are outside the, uh, what they call the, the, the safe planetary boundary. So if it's safe, it's green, basically that's the first circle. And when you move outside, uh, you start to get uncertainties. And then there's even a second circle when it's really just beyond uncertainty, that is a very high risk. And you see that in fact, there are four domains where we are already outside the safe operating zone. So we are moving outside the area, the stable area of the Holocene in an area which humans have ne never experienced. So this considers climate change. Uh, we all know about the biodiversity loss. Uh, of course, we, we use much too much land. That's uh, mainly deforestation, but also biochemical flows. These are made, made, mainly nutrients, uh, phosphor, nitrogen, nitrogen that go in the oceans. And even recently, in a very recent paper, even here on this Nobel entities, where there's a question mark, meaning that so far the boundary was not quantified. So there's a, a paper discussing that, in fact, also there already we are in the red area. We are outside the safe uh, operating zone on, on our planet. Now, focusing specifically on climate change, which is, of course, a, a, a hot topic in the sense of the world, uh, uh, the best thing you can do is always look the, up the IPCC reports. Here I show you the first figure of the summary report for policymakers of the working group one. And on the left here, you see the temperature over the last 2000 years, where you see that in fact, gradually we went to a colder period in terms of global temperature on earth. But all of a sudden, uh, this was the start of the industrial revolution, kicked in this rapid increase in temperature. Today, we are at plus 1.1 degree global average temperature on the globe. And even if you go back to 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 uh, to other to periods longer uh, far further away, in the last one hundred thousand years, the the, the, the climate scientists uh, found out that the temperature never exceeded plus one degree. So now we are at already at plus one point one degree. So we are at temperatures that the human species, Homo sapiens, has never experienced before. And on the right, you see a zoom in this uh, in the last 200 years, basically. And, and the bands here uh, represent, in fact, simulations. And the, the interesting thing with simulations is you can switch the human off. You can switch the human activities off and just see what would have happened just naturally. And that's, that's the blue curve here, that these are the blue simulations. And you see that, of course, I mean, there are vari variabilities. Uh, year to year variabilities due to solar and volcanic changes. Uh, but globally, I mean, the curve would have stayed flat. And then if you switch the human on, you get this brown band and you see it follows basically the observed temperature rise. And, and for that reason, the IPPC says that, I mean, the, the, the temperature rise that we experience is 100% attributed to human activities. And what personally strikes me the most is in fact the fact that the takeoff here of this curve happened around uh, the 70s, 1970s. And, and that's, that's basically uh, the time when I was born, which, which means that all this happened in my lifetime. It shows how, how rapid this temperature rise actually is. It's, a, it's on a time scale of decades. And, and so this is something that is really extremely fast now and where we also have to react now extremely fast uh, to stop this temperature rise. Because if we don't stop this, I mean, this is uh, what, what may happen. This comes from uh, another, it's another figure from the IPCC report uh, where you see in fact projections, you see uh, different uh, uh, what they call socioeconomic pathways. And, and the red curves are basically here, business as usual, we don't do uh, uh, much, we don't change a lot of things. That's basically, I would argue that's basically the track on which we are currently. The orange thing is uh, if we would fulfill, if all the nations would fulfill the climate pledges 
they made in, in the context of the Paris Climate Agreement. You know, there are pledges that have to be sent to the United Nations every couple of years and so on. If all these pledges would be fulfilled, this would bring us on, on this orange curve, almost near to three degrees at the end of the century in terms of temperature rise. What should be done is in fact, uh, is that we stay on the blue curves, which means a temperature increase uh, at maximum of 1.5 or maybe two degrees Celsius. And the reason why we should stay at this level, you see it here on the right, this is an assessment of the risks at the same scale. So here we are actually today, this is this gray band, 1.1 degree global temperature raise. And here you see different risks uh, to different uh, risk categories that they identified in, in the IPCC report. And if it's, if it's white, there's no risk. If it's yellow, there are moderate risks. And if it gets orange and red, the risks are high and Bordeaux is, is very high risk. And what you clearly see that, I mean, even now already we have some areas where the risks are, are, are becoming high and we know all these floodings, you know, the, uh, the droughts, the, 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 the fires in, in the summer and so on. Uh, I mean, all these are, are these areas where we are in the orange uh, red part. But if you move now to three or four or five degrees, I mean, you see everything is red or even Bordeaux red. So, I mean, nobody can really predict what will happen, but I think the probability that it will, it will work out right is basically zero. And an aspect that I think uh, you cannot neglect, I mean, if you, if you look into the problem of climate change and even environmental impacts globally is the question of the responsibilities. And to illustrate this, I show here, that's from a recent paper in Nature Sustainability, the per capita uh, carbon footprint for each decile of regional population. So you see the different regions in the world. Uh, every region was divided in 10 circles. Sometimes they overlap. That's why you don't see the 10 circles. And, and then you see basically what's the amount of carbon footprint per person in this area. And the colors, the different circles are basically income levels. If it's blue, it's very low income. If the income rises, it's, it's, it's getting yellow or red and, and then turns basically gray or, or dark gray. And you see definitely that not everybody on this planet has the same uh, uh, carbon footprint. Uh, so uh, we are not all equal. It's sometimes you hear, well, we, all humans have to do this or that. That's not the case. I mean, some humans are basically at a safe uh, limit uh, specifically when you look here, uh, but the others when you go on the other end, you, uh, you see, for example, the 10% the of the richest people in the US have almost uh, 50 tons of CO2 uh, per capita. So there are these inequalities and uh, they can of course not be neglected if you think about the uh, policy implementations. Now turning to space science. So what can be done? I mean, of course, the first thing is that try to measure the environmental impact of space activities. And uh, the best way to do that, I mean, the best method uh, to do that is in fact to conduct an environmental life cycle analysis of the space activities. And, uh, and, and, and the European Space Agency, ESA, is in fact very advanced on, on this topic. They have this clean space initiative. And since roughly 10 years, since a decade, they're doing this. They're doing environmental life cycle analysis of space activities. And basically what you do uh, in, in these uh, analysis, that you, you look, I mean, what you take from nature, minerals, uh, metals, uh, energy, I mean, fossil fuels and so on, uh, they are basically coming into your process. Uh, our process in space is uh, of course, building rockets and satellites. So R&D and the infrastructures related to that, the production, of the satellites and the assembly of the rockets, satellites, and so on. The launch campaign, meaning the integration of the satellite on, on the launcher, the fueling, and so on. Then the launch event. It's interesting, in fact, when you read in the press about the carbon footprint of, uh, of space activities, you always read only about the launch event and never about all the rest. So, uh, I mean, launch event is, of course, a part of it, but you will see very soon it's, in fact, a tiny part of it. 
and then at the end, the disposal of the rockets. And out comes from this, of course, greenhouse gases creating global warming. We will speak about ozone depletion, uh, which is a very important topic. And then all the different pollutions, air, water, and eventually soil and, and other pollutions. So that's basically this environmental life cycle analysis. It's a very sophisticated machinery to try to assess all these impacts. Uh, of course, you have to think about the boundaries of the evaluation. What do you take into account? And this is again here coming from a slide from, from, from ESA. So you find again, when you think about the launcher, uh, they think about R&D, the infrastructure, uh, all the related activities like qualification, that's what they call accompanying activities, but then the, the, the production of the launcher stages, uh, the transport, you have to, to move the thing. I mean, for European launchers, it's a, the Kourou Space Center. Uh, uh, propellant production, propellant production can eventually be a very important factor contributor to the, to the footprint. And then you have, of course, the launch campaign, so all the integration activities, the fueling, and then the launch event. And then when you think about a space mission, because it's not only the rocket, I mean, it's also the satellite and so on. In the space mission, you have, of course, phase A and B, and there's essentially office work and traveling, and then you, you produce your satellite, again, office work, traveling, but then even production, of course, and uh, assembly, integration, and tests. Uh, then you launch the thing, I mean, your first launch campaign, then you have the launch, and here basically is all this carbon footprint uh, or environmental footprint from the launcher. You need ground stations to consider. Uh, when you when you run your satellite, of course, I mean, there is no direct environmental impact because it's not on the Earth anymore. Uh, but of course, you need still, I mean, uh, ground support for the operations. And eventually at the end, there's re-entry, uh, there's disposal. And of course, related infrastructure. So in fact, there's a lot of things that are taken into account when you do these studies. Now I give you some, uh, some indications of what's actually going on. This is a, uh, a representation of a finding from, from ESA of the impacts of an Ariane 5 uh, launch, the typically Ariane rocket. What you see here on this graph, this is only in relative percentages. So 0% on the left and 100% on the right. So unfortunately, ESA never gives absolute numbers, but they give contributions. So you know what is contributing where and how much. And when you do this environmental life cycle analysis, you not only get the climate impact, what is called your global warming, you get a lot of other different impacts. So this photochemical oxidant formation, this is basically the smog that we know in our cities. Uh, ozone depletion, it's obvious, uh, uh, depleting the ozone in the stratosphere. Uh, air acidification, that's what creates uh, the acid rain. Uh, then you have different uh, Toxicities or ecotoxicities in the oceans for humans to fresh water. They assess how much metals are depleted, how much fossil fuels are depleted, what's the primary energy consumption, water consumption, how much nutrition go in the fresh water in the ocean, and also at the end, what is the ionization, uh, ionizing radiation of your activities. And what you see is here the different uh, stages. Uh, uh, different aspects of a production of an Ariane 5. So stage production in blue, the transport, the propellants and consumables. This is a uh, qualification uh, activities, launch campaign and launch event. And when you, for example, look here just into the global warming, the first, uh, the first bar here, you see the launch event. So the, the thing where you see all the, uh, the smoke coming out of the rocket is in fact a very, very tiny part of the global warming footprint, of the, of the carbon footprint of a rocket. There's a big contribution coming here from the propellants, just from the production of the propellants. And there's a big contribution just coming from the production of the stage. Where the launch event is in fact important is for the ozone layer. This is here, here uh, ozone depletion, the, the third the third row here is uh, uh, the launch event has a big impact on the ozone in the stratosphere. And it, it also has an impact on, uh, on, on the air acidification and the marine ecotoxicity. That's because, for example, very often the rocket 
remains fall in the ocean and pollute then of course the ocean. So, I mean, this you can of course discuss very long about just this only graph and just to give you an impression of what's going on, this different contribution. And that the law, I mean, the main one, one of the messages here is that the launch event itself is just a part of the of the of the overall footprint. And if there's more than carbon footprint, there is a specifically ozone depletion, which can be an important issue. Now, here's a focus on propellant production and combustion. And what I did here, uh, I based this on a work, uh, a master thesis. It was recently published assessing the uh, absolute carbon footprint of uh, propellant production and combustion. And, and then I listed here the typical launchers that are currently active. There's of course very, very small launchers and they have basically of course a very small footprint in absolute numbers here. And then there are launchers with a larger footprint. There are even launchers with a negative footprint. I will come to that. And, and what you see is in fact that uh, of course the biggest rockets like the, the space launch system that uh, launched Artemis recently has of course a huge footprint, 140,000 tons of CO2 equivalent just from the production of the propellants. So what you see is uh, in fact also there, it depends what propellant you use actually. So uh, there are rockets that are fueled with kerosene or RP1, it's a highly refined kerosene Sorry. And they have, in fact, the lowest production footprint, but uh, the largest combustion footprint. And the examples here are the Soyuz rocket or the Falcon rockets. <coughs> then uh, hydrogen has, in fact, a very large production footprint. But when, it, when, you, when you burn hydrogen, it just produces water, essentially, it has basically a negligible combustion footprint. And an example here is the Delta IV heavy uh, that, that is just using hydrogen. And the issue there is, of course, to get the green hydrogen uh, to reduce, for example, here the, the carbon footprint. Uh, and then you have rockets that have uh, the burner mix and, and, and specifically use solid boosters. An example is the Ariane rocket or also the, uh, the space launch system. And there's the interesting thing is when the boosters burn, in fact, and I, I will explain you this in a minute, they cool, in fact, the troposphere. And, and that's why uh, you have, in fact, a negative fo footprint from the combustion of some of the rockets. And now to explain you more in detail what happens when you launch a rocket. In fact, a, a rocket is the only human-made uh, object that injects matter uh, through, throughout the entire atmosphere and specifically in the stratosphere. There's no other activities. I mean, planes are flying lower and, and all other activities are of course happening in the troposphere. So when you launch a, a, a rocket, uh, one thing is for example, when, when, when you burn kerosene, for example, you create a lot of black carbon or soot. These are little particles that are very light and that they will accumulate in the upper stratosphere at a relatively high altitude. And then with the winds they spread around and will at the end basically cover the entire, the entire earth. And, and this creates in fact a kind of black umbrella that will absorb part of, this, of the solar light. So there will be less solar light uh, coming to the troposphere. And, and in fact, this will cool the troposphere eventually. And then you have the alumina particles. These are coming out of these uh, rocket boosters. And this will create a white umbrella which is lower because these particles are bigger and they will reflect sunlight back into space and, uh, and, and then also uh, block, since it's a kind of umbrella, block the light uh, on, on the surface. And so they also will cool the troposphere. But then at the same time, these particles, they will heat up the stratosphere and this will accelerate ozone depletion. And in addition, the aluminum particles uh, the chemical reactions uh, on these particles will also reduce the ozone. So in fact, it's the uh, ozone that will suffer a lot from, from, from these launches. And what's in fact interesting is that, that this kind of thing that injecting particles in the stratosphere, that what is called 
geoengineering. That's exactly what the geoengineering freaks uh, want to do. And so in some extent, I mean, rocket launches are today already an uncontrolled geoengineering experiment. And because in fact, the, the entire physics of that, I mean, I explained to you basically how it works, but a lot of the details are in fact not yet understood. Specifically also about how, how long the thing lasts in the stratosphere, how they circulate and what ultimately the impact is on, on the Earth's climate. Now, also I wanted to give you some absolute numbers. And as I said, I mean, ESA is not publishing them. So you have uh, to try to infer them. And that's what I did here for the Ariane rockets. So these are orders of magnitude. I mean, when I say orders of magnitude and I write 30,000 tons, it could be maybe 25,000 tons or 35,000 tons. Probably not outside this range, but that gives you a kind of uncertainty on, on this kind of number. I mean, you can infer these numbers when you look at this relative estimates and you combine them with absolute estimates, for example, on the carbon uh, footprint of the pro propellant production. That's how basically I, I calibrated and estimated these numbers. So typically Ariane 5 and Ariane 6 is not very different, around 30,000 tons CO2 equivalent if you launch a single rocket. For the Falcons, there was in fact a study uh, published recently, but a, a, bit, a, a bit simplified study and there you find numbers of 10,000 to 15,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. And this takes, of course, into account that some parts of the rocket are reused. But this gives an order of magnitude what goes on in terms of carbon footprint when you, when you launch a rocket. But of course, it's not a rocket uh, alone. You need infrastructure. And you find numbers for the Kennedy Space Center. It's uh, 100,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So uh, these days, or a couple of years ago, they launched typically uh, 10 rockets, roughly 10 rockets per year. And if you add this then to the rocket footprint, it means another 10,000 tons per rocket launch. The footprint of the Kourou Space Center is around 40,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So a bit lower, but that's of course also a smaller space center. And, and uh, well, I don't know the number of rockets they launch in a year. Maybe it's uh, uh, comparable to the Kennedy Space Center, maybe a bit lower, uh, it's certainly not, not about above 10. And then you also uh, have, of course, ground facilities. And, and there is one publication on the, the footprint of, the, of NASA's ground test facilities uh, already a couple of years ago in 2011 was 140,000 tons of CO2 per year. So also not negligible numbers. But then, of course, you're not only launching the rocket, there's also the, the entire space mission. And this is now some data, again, provided by ESA on uh, Earth observing satellite, the Sentinel 3D mission. And here you see the different phases of the, uh, of the production. And you see, just focus here uh, on the first uh, line here, global warming, so the, the carbon footprint. Uh, you see, in fact, that the, the rocket launch, so the rocket activities, the rocket building, the fabrication and so on, is a significant fraction of, of a, a, a space mission. So it's typically roughly, for, in terms of carbon footprint, it's roughly half of the carbon footprint is coming from the rocket. The other half is coming uh, likely from, from the payload you are launching. It depends, of course, on how big the payload is, how complex it is, and so on. But just to give you a, a, an order of magnitude uh, estimate. You see also here that this here, this, uh, uh, this purple uh, part here, this is the, the use phase, so the operations phase. And you see that this is, so I don't remember what, what, the, uh, what the operations time, the lifetime was basically here in this, in this study, maybe something like 10 years. Uh, so this is not dominant if the lifetime is not too long, but if you operate a satellite over several decades, the use phase of the, of the satellite can eventually become an important contribution to the overall footprint. Uh, you see here also that the, uh, I mean the, the, the fabrication phase of your, of your satellite, the phase CD, uh, is, is, is part of the footprint, which is visible and, and specifically here for the mineral resource depletion. I will, I will show you immediately why this is the case. 
uh, in fact, there is a, they, they, the ESA also published uh, a more detailed analysis of this phase CD, where actually in this phase you produce your satellite. And what is very interesting, and here it's now split by the, the, difficult, uh, the different um, uh, uh, activities, basically building the platform, building the payload, uh, bu building the propellant, where you're producing the propellant, and this is basically ne negligible because there was probably very little propellant on this on the satellite. The transport is also negligible here. Integration activities are visible, but the, the striking thing is in fact office work and traveling. So it's not the fact that you produce a satellite. I mean, the, 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 the material production of the satellite that makes the imprint. It's all the associated uh, activities of humans working in office. And I think everyone who's ever worked on a space project who knows about all the paperwork you have to do is not surprised that at the end, eventually the office work and the, the traveling, going to meetings and so on is dominating the, the footprint uh, not only the carbon footprint, but also for many other environmental indicators, the footprint of, uh, of uh, satellite production. And you see again here, I mean, this is the, this one thing, uh, what was a bit striking. So I was wondering why is the mineral resource depletion here, the, the platform so important? This is in fact uh, the, the footprint of the germanium needed for the solar cells. So you have these kind of singularities. Sometimes you have a, a very, uh, impacting uh, 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 activity that eventually dominates completely the footprint in some areas. Now, also to give you here some absolute numbers, it's even more difficult to find to find some. <clears throat> but there was a, a PhD thesis written a couple of years ago, and these are uh, numbers based for case studies. So these are not satellites that actually exist or existed. These were just case studies, but done using a complete life cycle uh, assessment framework. So the first one, this is here, a small satellite mission to the moon, relatively light, uh, 286 kilogram, relatively cheap, 165 million euros, a relatively short mission duration, and a shared Ariane launch. So only a quarter of the Ariane launch is in fact attributed to this mission. And this gave them 11,200 tons uh, as carbon footprint for this mission. Here's another example, the near core mission. These are six nano uh, satellites for asteroid collision and flyby, even smaller mass and uh, amount of money, a dedicated launch with an Indian launcher and uh, 8,780 tons of CO2 equivalent. So you see, if you have a small mission, it's, it's of the order of 10,000 tons eventually. So as Thierry mentioned recently, I mean, we looked into basically the, the footprint of astronomy globally and, 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 and all the satellites that are used in astronomy. And here is a list of all the satellites that we used in our lab to do science, for example, in the year 2019. And uh, it goes from the Hubble Space Telescope to uh, the Demeter satellite, and these are basically ordered here by footprint. And we made this estimate by scaling uh, the, uh, the examples I have shown you previously on the previous slide. And there are two ways you can scale. Either you use the, the payload mass, so this gives you the blue answer, or uh, you use the, the mission cost, this gives you the orange answer. So you see, of course, I mean, depending of, of what type of scaling you use, you have quite some different answers, uh, but I mean, the, the differences are typically factors of two, maybe, or three. So these are still good order of magnitude estimates. And you see, this is now here in kilotons CO2 equivalent. You see, for example, for the Hubble Space Telescope, the estimate is, uh, is more than half a million or, or even more than a million tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, here, for example, the reason why the mission cost estimate is, is higher is because of all the service missions to the Hubble Space Telescope that are not reflected in the, in the weight of the Hubble Space Telescope. And when we extrapolated uh, our estimates to the world fleet of the active space missions in astronomy, we came up with, a, with uh, an annual footprint. So every year, uh, the, the typical emissions are between 460 and 600 kilotons of CO2 equivalent. 
uh, the Ross Wilson did in fact a very similar assessment uh, made also a scaling based in fact on the mass uh, and based on, on other elements in the life cycle assessment and they estimate the total impact of all space activities in 2018 this was six million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, in this year and and so what you see here in this plot is in fact for the various environmental impact categories what's actually the contribution to the worldwide impacts that exist just basically when you take climate change uh, what's the, the contribution to the carbon footprint it's to the overall world carbon footprint it's of course tiny here uh, uh, and, and the most important impact category is in fact as i mentioned already earlier ozone depletion that's really the area of biggest concern still today the contribution of the space activities to the, the, the global ozone depletion by human activities is around 0.8%. Uh, another X on the other axis here is shown not the contribution to what actually human activity is doing, but actually what, what would be allowed in terms of planetary boundaries. So today, the, the, the space activities contribute a, a per mil, basically, some, somewhere in this area, to the planetary boundaries. Now, the, the interesting question, of course, to ask is, but what will, what will be the impact tomorrow? Because we all hear about new space and, and new stuff to be launched, and I will talk about this in a minute. So Wilson also uh, uh, made a study for the future. And the future is not defined in terms of time but they define it just in terms of an increase in the number of, of launches per year. Today, we have around 100, 110 launches per year, but projections for, for current trends estimate that the, in, the, in, in the next decades, we may reach around 750 launches per year or, or even more. And, and, and so uh, typical, he assumed typical spacecrafts uh, like uh, 5,000 spacecraft plus and in orbit with average mass of one ton and 10 year lifetime every year. So these are plausible numbers in terms of what the current projections are. And when you when he plugs in these numbers in his in his machinery, in his analysis, he finds out that the annual carbon footprint will rise by a factor of 20, that up to 120 megatons per year. And here you see the impact, the contribution uh, to the planetary boundaries and also the contribution to the current levels uh, of uh, human activity impacts. And then you see it's of course not 100%, I mean, this would be outrageous, but it, it, it becomes a, a, a percent level. So it becomes really a non-negligible contribution of human activities. Uh, for example, uh, 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 commercial flying is today at, these, at this level. And we speak a lot about that we have to reduce commercial flying to reduce its impact. And so in, in, in a decade or so, uh, uh, space activities can be of the same level as uh, today is commercial flying. And, and so these are really non-negligible contributions to the planetary boundaries in many categories, not only uh, uh, carbon footprint, but you see it's basically all, all the, the environmental impact categories. Now, uh, another thing, uh, maybe you heard it already in this, in this conference series, uh, but there's in fact another boundary that is discussed. It's not really a planetary boundary, but an orbital boundary. And what is shown here, that's the number of objects uh, that are in orbit. And here is counted, I think it's objects uh, larger than 10 centimeters, because below that size, it's very difficult to track you don't know how many objects exist, in fact. And this, you see how the, the number of objects evolves in time. And there are two events here. One, there was a, a Chinese anti-satellite missile test where you explode a satellite and then you increase, of course, the number of objects in orbit. And then uh, uh, a couple of years later, there was a, a satellite collision and again, produces a lot of debris and objects in orbit. And the interesting uh, assessment, in fact, in the study is 
that the, the today already the debris creation rate just by collisions or by fragmentation, you know, sometimes batteries explode in space and stuff like that. So the debris creation rate is already larger than the natural decay rate. So that's the natural decay in, in low Earth orbit because of atmospheric drag, but the debris creation rate is larger than the decay rate. So the debris will continue to uh, increase even if we stopped today completely any uh, uh, launch activities. And this is in fact uh, known as the Kessler syndrome, uh, uh, which was in fact, uh, I think it was, 10 years ago or so that, that this, this uh, threat was assessed for the first time. And we are already in fact in a regime where uh, at a very short time scale, maybe a decade or a few decades, the low Earth orbit may eventually become completely unusable for hundreds of thousands of years because there's just too much debris, too much stuff that's flying around. So as soon as you, you place a satellite in this orbit, it will be destroyed by, by, uh, by impacts. Uh, there's of course an additional uh, a related impact that I will not discuss here in detail. Uh, and this is the light pollution. I mean, today already it, uh, there is a, a measurable contribution to the night sky background from these debris in low Earth orbit. And we know we hear, we hear a lot about when we do astronomy about uh, satellite constellations, and, and, and the threat they, 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 they pose to astronomical observations. So what should we do actually? I mean, this is here showing the, 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 the uh, over the time how the, 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 the global carbon emission increased over time. So here, this little dip here, this was the COVID. Uh, uh, the COVID impact in, in 2020. Now we are back again, but we are not yet full out. I mean, this is 21 here. So we have to see in 2022, will the global emissions rise again or will they stay stable? But in any case, what we have to do is decrease rest drastically and very rapidly. Again, as I said before, I mean, it, the time scale here is decades uh, over which we have to act. And you may have followed this recently. There was a ministerial meeting uh, of, uh, for ESA setting out the budget for the next uh, couple of years. And it's in fact very interesting to read the resolution, what is called the resolution on, on ESA accelerating the use of space in Europe. So we have to accelerate. But at the same time, when you, when you, when you read the resolution, uh, resolution 36, they say the, the Ministerial Council encourages the Director General to pursue actions in view of reducing the carbon footprint of the agency by 46% by 2030 as compared to the 2019 baseline. So this is dramatic, 46% is basically dividing by half in the next seven years. Uh, but then a few resolutions later, you read the Ministerial Council invites the Director General to realize a bottom forward-looking growth of ESA. So, I mean, I don't know how this works out. Uh, maybe somebody has an answer. Maybe the answer is between the word encourages and invites. Uh, but for me, this is a, a clear contradiction. And I, I'm really interested to see how ESA will now translate this into an action plan. Uh, because when you look around, I mean, new space is on the lips of everybody. That's a new business. I mean, you find a website site finding that the space sector to be bigger than oil industry. And when you see what harm does oil industry to our planet currently, I mean, this is not really a positive statement. <laughs> and, and you can also look at the space launch service market trends. Uh, so, of course, everything is rising, more rocket launches. I mean, that's the entire idea of uh, SpaceX to make rocket launch is cheaper. Uh, and if rocket launches are cheaper, you can launch more rockets. And of course, this will rocket up the, the footprint at the end. And of course, associated to it, it's not only launching stuff in space, it's all the associated services, the, uh, the nice applications you have on your phone communicating eventually with satellites and, and getting a lot of data and so on. So it has an entire economy around that, that just pushes for more growth. 
The question is, of course, does space science follow the same trend? You can say, well, maybe that's the space industry, that's uh, space tourism, but we in science, we are not doing that. But here you see the same trend. So this is in fact a work in progress that I'm currently doing. And this shows you here the number of operating satellites and probes in, in astronomy. So this is solar missions, uh, plasma missions, planetary missions, astrophysics missions. And you see, this is just a number here, number of operating satellites. Well, the first peak here, 16 in the 60s, uh, 70s, this was of course uh, the space race, uh, the flights to moon, Mars, uh, Venus, and so on. Then uh, uh, the situation calmed down, but since uh, uh, a couple of years or uh, several decades, it's, it, it's increasing again. And the current trend is that we increase uh, annually uh, the number of astronomy satellites and probes uh, in space by 4.5% every year over the last 20 years. You can turn this into a carbon footprint. Again, if you use, uh, if you, if you base on the mass of the, the things that you launch, and that's why here this, the space race becomes a huge peak because the things that were launched like uh, the lunar lander were extremely massive, extremely, a lot of mass was launched and eventually a, a, a very huge carbon footprint was associated to these launches, but then it calmed down. But now again, we are here in this rising trend. And when you just look at these numbers, actually the carbon footprint increased by a factor of four over the last 20 years. So this is a 7.5% growth of the carbon footprint per year. So it's clear that this is not sustainable and, and of course completely unaligned with the ESA and the EU uh, emission reduction targets. So what should be done? And uh, to answer this question, I think a very good uh, first introductory read is, is the, the book by Kate Rovers called Donut Economics. I don't know if, if some of you may have already read this. This again shows here in fact the planetary boundary, what, what she calls here ecologi ecological ceiling. And you see here again, this uh, categories like climate change, biodiversity loss, land conversion, and, and nitrogen and phosphorus loading. These are the areas where we already have uh, uh, basically overshoot the ceiling. But then she argues also, I mean, there's a social foundation. I mean, if you don't have enough water, if you don't have enough food, if you don't have enough health, it's very difficult to, to live decently on Earth. And we know there are areas like that on Earth where, where people don't have enough for the, so there's a shortfall in the social foundations. And that's what she tries to quantify. And this see, you see here uh, uh, with, this, with this red color in, in the inner circle. So the idea that she promotes is basically that we have, we have to, to move humanity globally between both circles. That's why this is called donut economics, which means that some have to scale down, reduce, uh, degrow, and others have to scale up to, to, to accomplish at least uh, the minimum you need for a decent life on the planet. And that's basically the, the, the thing we have to to, to move towards. So to finish with the slide on, on, on how can we move towards sustainable space science, I think it's pretty obvious that if we want to keep our planet habitable, uh, the human societies have to switch to a sustainable socio-economic pathway. I think the IPCC reports show this very clearly, but I think also when you think about biodiversity loss, uh, it's the same story, even maybe it's even a, even a stronger story because when you see how much life has already been lost on earth, uh, I find it always very astonishing that people believe that humans can survive while all other life disappears on earth. I mean, we are part of the living of, on the earth. But coming back to, to also to, uh, to the carbon footprint, I mean, the moving to a socio-economic pathway means concerns, of course, all human activities. And, and also the IPCC states this very clearly. And this includes, of course, space sciences. I mean, I just showed you the inequalities before that we have on our planet, what concerns our environmental impacts. And here we have the same 
inequalities also in, in the domain of space science sciences. And if if the space sciences don't move, I mean, why should other activity sectors move? I mean, it will be very hard to justify this. And so this likely implies that we have to reduce our dependency on new space missions. And I think I, I, I demonstrated this on the previous slides. So this means, for example, deeper use of the abundant archival data. We have a lot of archival data that can be used to continue to do very good uh, space science. The second point is that the decarbonization has to become a funding priority. Today, it's very difficult to convince funding agencies to put a single euro on the table to decarbonize. I mean, this needs real, this needs, needs real investments, decarbonization, and money has to move into that area. And ultimately, this means also that we have to build and launch less new facilities. Otherwise, I mean, if we just launch more and more as we do currently, I mean, there's no way to get this un under control. So this certainly implies that we need a systemic change. And this includes, of course, individuals, but also labs, research and funding organization, and ultimately, of course, the governments. And maybe as also as a personal note, I think as a community, I mean, we should recognize our responsibilities in this area and also be exemplary because today it's scientists that are learned like the IPCC or the IPBS on, on the biodiversity. They are learned on what's going on on our planet. They talk about planetary boundaries. So if scientists don't act accordingly, I mean, they will lose, of course, sooner or later, all the credibility. And that's my concluding remark. And uh, I thank you a lot for your attention. And I hope that you will have interesting discussions. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for this fascinating presentation. I wish we could clap our hands. <laughs> and um, with this, uh, we opened uh, the discussion. So if any of the attendees has questions, please don't hesitate to write them in in um, in the chat. So let's start with one by uh, Emeline Beaumont. Hello, Emeline. <laughs> so the question is, um, Sorry, why doesn't ESA want to share the absolute numbers? So the official statement is it's, uh, it's uh, confidential, con confidentiality reasons, because behind this you have a space industry and so on, and they don't want, uh, eventually, if you, if you have these numbers, you can eventually find out about the industrial activities. I mean, but of course, if, if, you, if you give out aggregated numbers, nobody can track back what comes from what industry and so on. So I think they are just scary to give out these numbers. And I mean, it, it goes, it's really interesting because I mean, I, of course I tried to communicate uh, with them. And, and, and even if you, for example, there are papers out where, where people give some indications and so on. So you contact the authors. Sometimes you get never a reply. Sometimes you get an elusive reply. I get replies in the sense, well, this is proprietary of ESA. Please contact ESA to get out information. Uh, on the positive side, for the very first time, ESA sent me a, a, a document that, of course, they asked to keep confidential, where I got out some numbers, not those that I've shown you, but I got out some information. So, uh, but I think they are, they are just not very comfortable with their findings. Hmm. Okay. So I have a quick question because in your previous papers you you also included the the ground based facilities, which many of us are, are using, and here you put give more attention to to the space segment for obvious reasons. So could you just in a, in a very briefly in a nutshell uh, provide a summary of how these ground based facilities compare to to our uh, satellites? because you showed that it, it's not exactly the same issue. Hmm. Yeah, so, so our assessment for the ground-based facilities was that in fact the, the contribution in terms of carbon footprint was a bit higher compared to the space-based facilities. This can be easily understood because I mean, everything you do on ground is much more material. Mm -hmm. If you launch, for example, a billion, a billion euro versus space mission, 
with an Ariane uh, 5. It's 700, 800 tons of material to launch. If you build a 1 billion ground-based observatory like the ELT, for example, that ESO is building, it's 60,000 tons of steel and, uh, and concrete and stuff. So it's much more material, of course, if you do things on ground. And this, if things are material, in general, the, the, the related footprint is, is larger. And then also, of course, the number of, of infrastructures on ground is larger than, uh, than those that, that we launch into space. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there are, of course, issues there. And, uh, and, and there is the operations part also is more important, uh, at least so far of what I've seen for ground-based uh, observatories. There's also the thing that you regularly maintain or upgrade and, and, and also the lifetime is in fact longer. It's in fact, there's a, co a cumulative effect. I mean, a space mission disappears uh, typically after one or two or three decades. Uh, ground-based observatories almost never disappear. They really just accumulate. I mean, it's amazing how much old stuff is still around and still operating. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, Emeline just commented that uh, regarding the question uh, for ESA, is that they should be held accountable because we as citizens are paying them in a way right, exactly. so it should be visible to us. I 100% agree. I mean, it's our I, money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So a question by William Wall. Could you please explain again how rocket fuel consumption can result in a negative carbon footprint? It's in fact, uh, it's in fact that uh, when, when you inject particles in the stratosphere, they create an umbrella, they create a screen so that less solar light can reach Earth. So the Earth, the troposphere, the, the, the Earth's surface basically becomes cooler because you injected particles in the stratosphere. So the stratosphere, but this is thermally not communicating, the stratosphere becomes warmer and the tropos troposphere, where the, which, is, which counts for the climate, uh, for the global warming, is becoming cooler because you screen sunlight, basically. Okay, I hope this is... Okay, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question. Okay. The, uh, uh, I think it's a comment. Okay, question and comment by Emine Beaumont. One of the reasons to keep building new satellites is to advance the science, allow new detections. How can we justify to our community that we should kind of stop pushing forward and maybe try to dig into these archives you mentioned? Hmm. Well, I mean, there are several points. I mean, first, I never found somebody who disagreed with the point that we had a lot of archival data that we never really analyzed properly. Mm. So you can also argue, I man, is it a good use of public money that we just throw a lot of data away and not really explore it? Uh, so it, it, and, and ecologically, it would be just uh, much better to use just what we already have. And you can still advance science. Question is, do you always need new observations? Uh, and I think you still can advance science with archival data. Maybe it will advance less fast. Uh, but that's, that, that's one part. The other thing is eventually you don't need to stop totally sending new things, but you have to send less new, new uh, satellites mm -hmm. into, yes. into orbit. And sometimes we're just duplicating stuff. Uh, there are examples where satellites are basically in the same scientific domain are, are launched by different nations because everybody promotes competition and, and our mm. politicians promote competition. And if we would move to a system where there is more cooperation, instead of launching two or three or four satellites, you can just launch one satellite, but all together. The same applies, by the way, to the ground. Instead of building three or four observatories that all do basically the same, but try to compete each other, mm -hmm. just build one and mm -hmm. make the same advances scientifically, but with a much less uh, important uh, footprint. Yeah. I guess this is applies to the exploration of Venus. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is one example, but I mean, Mars is the same. Or look yes. at, the, at the moon. Everybody wants to go to the moon. I mean, this is exactly. really outrageous. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you ask somebody, why should we go to, to the moon? <laughs> it's a big silence in the room. <laughs> so here's, here's a question by Stephen Cornford. There are several satellite missions currently planned for, for carbon emission governance, like carbon sats. 
In your opinion, are these missions really necessary to enforce emission pledges, or do we have enough data without them? Hmm. That's a tricky question. No, it's not tricky. I mean, I mean, I, I can be very frank there. Because people always think, yeah, we have to do more research to, to, to fix things. I, I don't, frankly, I don't believe. I mean, we know what's going on. We know what's happening. We have the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. We know things with great precision. Uh, but the problem is, so the problem is not knowledge. The problem is action. And in fact, political action. And, and, and that's what I tried to communicate. I mean, with this idea that we have to change the social economic pathway which means we have to, to change the way how we operate economically and in our society. So in fact, the, the real problem, it's, it's a political problem mm. and that we, we will not solve this problem with more research here and there. Of course, you may eventually need a carbon tracking satellite to, if you want to implement, for example, carbon budget reductions or, or, or whatever, uh, limits uh, eventually you need uh, facilities to to track that you are really on the, on the right path and eventually you, you could use this but I, i'm frankly i don't believe that we need more knowledge to understand what's going on mm, okay so regarding the, the the kessler syndrome this is a question by ludwig klein so um sorry to come back to my favorite subjects solar activity is the rather low overall level of solar activity that we have been having since the 2000s responsible for the lack of depletion of the LEO from, from uh, space debris? That is, with the high level of activity we, exp we have in the mid 20th century, remove the Kessler syndrome? Uh, frankly, I have no idea. I mean, I would have, uh, I would have to look it up how much this uh, impacts uh, decay mm -hmm. rate. Uh, frankly, I don't know. I, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe there's something in this paper I, I cited before, mm -hmm. I have to look it up. Actually, this is a topic that will come up again in January in a talk given by Ilko Dornbos on the debris and um, how, how the orbits are filled with debris. Um, so Andrew Lazaevich, um, based on your evaluations, fascinating and frightening, can some space systems be replaced by ground-based networks and form a, a development office work, etc.? Well, certainly, because it's like interesting when, when it started with uh, space sciences, it was somehow reserved, uh, at least in astronomy, for, for areas where you couldn't observe from ground. So it was like infrared astronomy, uh, gamma ray astronomy, or X ray astronomy. Today, you go for everything in space. So things you could do in principle of ground, because uh, optical astronomy is, of course, easier in space if you don't have an atmosphere. But you can do a lot of things with adaptive optics and so on. Uh, so I think you you could go back basically in some sense to to only the windows that you exactly cannot do from ground to do it from space, and all the rest to do it you do it from ground. So I think there are certainly ways to uh, to, to to move back a bit mm. on, on the areas where you go to space today, but you could equally do things from ground. Okay. Um. So another question, this time by an astronaut, so Claude Collier. If the carbon footprint of space science uh, missions represents, say, one millionth or 10 millionths of the carbon footprint of all human activities, then reducing the dependency on new space missions will not change anything significant to the global warming problem. No? <laughs> well, I mean, as I said before, I mean, if it's uh, we are not at the one millionth level, we, we it becomes a level that becomes comparable to that of commercial flying, which is more at the percent level. Mm. And it's of course, I mean, you can always say a given activity has only a small footprint, so it doesn't, it does, it's not important. That's in fact, it's, it's interesting. That's in fact what you have to do if you are in the United States. Mm. You have to compare your individual activity to the global activity of the United States. And the obvious conclusion is always, well, it's negligible. Because mm. all Individually, all activities are negligible. But as I, as I said before, we have to scale down all activities without exception. I mean, again, that's also what the IPPC is, uh, emphasizes. I mean, otherwise, I mean, everybody is here. Well, my activity is more important than yours. I mean, it, 
if we don't collectively go into that and say, okay, we all have to play this game, then I don't see how it could work out. So uh, another question by St uh, Stefan Schröder is part of the environmental cost of space is due to personnel and offices, as you've shown. But if you scale back space research and space missions, these people would not stop going to the office. They would just go to different non-space offices. And that's, that does not distort the discussion to some degree, or that's, sorry, that's a question. Does that not distort the discussion? Well, when, when this suppose that you do everything just as we do it today, and, and you would scale one activity down and not the others. Mm. I mean, as I said before, you have to scale everything down. Mm. And, and we have to do things differently. So it's not about doing other things or, or, or stopping one activity. As I said, there may still be space activities, but they may uh, concentrate on different things, not on launching more things, but maybe uh, making things uh, better, smaller, uh, having, having less impact and, and so on. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not about that we have to change our activity sectors necessarily, but just we have to do them differently. It's very often also people ask me, so should I stop astronomy? Of course not, but we have to do astronomy differently. Mm. And it's more about thinking how we can invent a new narrative of doing our activities in a different way that is compliant uh, with the environment. So as, as time is, is running a little bit out, um, I have a, a last question is, several of us here are, teach at different university levels. What message would you give to young scientists who want to go into space science? Because for them, uh, watching a space mission or a rocket launch is something which is absolutely thrilling. And so how do you, well, what is the compromise you, you managed to find? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a question I ask myself. Well, frankly, that's 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 different, uh, difficult to say. But I mean, you can even I mean, if even if you move to space science, then move to the Clean Space Initiative of ESA, working on the environmental assessments, and so on. So I mean, you see, also in this field, you have some activities mm -hmm. that actually I mean, try to to work in the right direction. Uh, so don't 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 invent more rockets or or or, or try to to get the the price of rocket launches down or whatever. I mean, just try to understand how you can make this activity more sustainable. Mm. Okay. Well, with this, Jürgen, again, thank you very much on behalf of us all. all. I think this was really fascinating talk. I'm very glad that we managed to have you on board. And um, to all our attendees, we will meet again next week for the last talk of the year. That will be given by an airline pilot on uh, the impacts on, uh, on civil aviation. So again, Many thanks to all you all and hopefully see you next soon on this website.